By 1999, NVIDIA had risen to an almost unassailable rank in the world of graphics cards. While the Riva TNT 2 was the first to defeat the Voodoo 2 and SLI and place company at the forefront of 3DFX competitors, it was the upgraded Riva TNT 2 Ultra that was the first NVIDIA card to truly top the charts. By the time the GeForce 256 came out in October of that year, there was hardly anybody else that could match up. Or so most thought. ATI, a company established in 1985 and the oldest among the five major competitors of the time, struggled to keep up in the new world of 3D. Although staunch and resolute, they seemed to always trail the pack, their product history laden with missteps and disappointments. The Rage Fury Max, an 11th hour act of desperation that utilized two of their underperforming flagship accelerators, failed to stack up to what NVIDIA coined the GPU, a chip capable of performing triangle setup and lighting in hardware. Just six months after the release of the first GeForce, NVIDIA would cement their position further with the GeForce 2 GTS. A few months later, ATI would release the Radeon, and with it, the first true answer to the world of GPUs that NVIDIA had created would finally arrive. The Radeon is a new architecture from the ground up, built on a 180 nanometer process and consisting of 30 million transistors. Internally referred to as the RAGE 6 or R100, it was originally to be called the Radium, before concerns from the Japan team over associations with radiation called for a last second change. Initially released in two different variants, the card came at 166 megahertz on the core and memory for the 32 MB model, and 183 megahertz core and memory for the 64 MB megabyte version. Both were equipped with DDR memory, so transfer speed was doubled over its 128-bit bus. Later, an SDR version came out as well at a lower price. The model I have here is clocked at 155 megahertz. First, let's take a look at performance in 3D Mark 2000. I'll just be comparing the results from ATI's own lineup today. For this benchmark, I've added in results for the previous flagship, the RAGE 128 Pro, also known as the RAGE Fury Pro from my Windows 98 machine. So keep in mind that that machine is going to be running a bit slower. It has an Athlon XP 1700 Plus in it, um, and it's running slower DDR memory. The rest of the results, of course, were run on my XP machine with much higher specs. So right away, you can see between the Radeon cards in the center, there's pretty linear scaling uh, between the different versions. The Radeon SDR 64 megabyte trails behind the Radeon DDR32 MB by 12%, and then the DDR64 MB is 11% faster than the 32 megabyte card. Then you look at the Rage 128 Pro, which is just about half the speed of even the slowest Radeon card. Uh, we're looking at a 97% speed improvement. And then you look at the Radeon 7500, which was a later generation iteration, and that scores 9,082, which is 53% faster than the Radeon DDR64 megabyte. Going between flagships, the Radeon DDR64MB, which was the top of the line version of that card, up against the previous flagship, the Rage 128 Pro, um, excluding the Fury Max, um, the difference is two and a half times. So that is a huge increase from generation to generation. The core comes equipped with only two pixel pipes, and each one is loaded with three texture mapping units. This is the only architecture to attempt a triple texturing configuration. The core and memory are synchronized, so the clock speed is unfortunately linked between them. Okay, and here we have 3D Mark 2001's second edition. So we see that the Radeon SDR is, again, almost 100% faster than the RAGE 128 Pro. And we also have, again, just like in 3D Mark 2000, pretty much linear scaling across the three different variants of the original Radeon. And the Radeon 7500, again, a much newer card in terms of manufacturing process, is 58% faster than the 64 MB DDR version, the flagship Radeon card. 
So that's grown a little bit. The margins have increased across the board slightly compared to 3D Mark 2000, probably owing to this being a more GPU intensive test. Going again from flagship to flagship, the 64 MB version of the Radeon is 2.6 times the performance of the Rage 128 Pro. Keep in mind, these are both cards with two pixel pipelines, so this is a huge increase in performance just from improvements in architecture. But I also wanted to focus on one game demo in particular, the high detail lobby scene, which is one of the most graphically intensive tests for fixed function cards. And this is actually, uh, this actually made some interesting changes to the distribution of the performance here. We're no longer seeing linear scaling between the various versions of the Radeon card because the SDR version actually suffers more in performance compared to the DDR cards. Now, keep in mind the 32 MB DDR card, while it is clocked faster than the STR card, it does have half the memory, so really bandwidth is what counts the most in this test. You're also seeing an increase in the performance margin between the 7500 and the top of the line original Radeon, 68% faster this time versus 58% faster in the overall score. And then we also see the 64 MB DDR card reaching again 2.6 times faster performance than the Rage 128 Pro. This is identical to the overall score. So very intensive game demo and some interesting results. The Radeon suffered in 16-bit color compared to NVIDIA counterparts, but due to greater architectural efficiency, screamed in 32-bit mode, which I use for all my testing. This is due to a technology introduced with the Radeon series called Hyper-Z, the first ever Z-buffer compression and geometry calling feature in a consumer graphics card. As it turns out, this was a pretty revolutionary idea, which would prove to be crucial to improving resolution performance scaling and memory bandwidth effectiveness in GPUs from that point forward. In Quake 3, once again, we don't really have linear scaling between the three different versions of the Radeon card because this game also shows a much sharper drop off in performance with the SDR version versus the DDR version. Comparing the 64 MB DDR card to the 32 MB version, we see a marginal 11% difference in performance mostly due to clock speed. When comparing the 32 MB card to the 64 MB SDR card, there is an improved in performance of 28%. Then going to the Radeon 7500, we see a 48% increase in performance compared to the top of the line Radeon, getting a very smooth 86 frames per second in this game at 1280 by 1024. The Radeon architecture would be usurped the following year by the R200 chip, which supported programmable pixel shading. It would carry on, however, in the mainstream product that year, the Radeon 7500, a card built on a smaller 150 nanometer process and clocked much, much higher. It would prove how effective ATI's DirectX 7 architecture truly was, even against NVIDIA's strongest fixed function offerings. For our next game, we're testing the original Unreal Tournament. And once again, we're seeing the SDR Radeon dropping off more sharply compared to the 3D Mark tests. We're beginning to see a trend with more intensive games. As games get more advanced, the SDR card tends to lag further behind the DDR cards, especially since I'm doing all of the testing in 32-bit color. The Radeon 7500 also doesn't get as much of a boost over the flagship Radeon DDR64 MB as it does in the previous tests. This time it's only a 32% increase, which probably means we're seeing a little bit of a CPU bottleneck here, but not too much. All of these cards turn in excellent performance in Unreal Tournament. This is again running at 1280 by 1024, so very impressive. Next we're going to follow up with its successor, Unreal Tournament 2004. Now this game is much newer than these cards were designed to handle and none of them turn in playable performance at 1280 by 1024 with all the settings at max minus detail textures which was turned off. And we're seeing that just between the DDR cards there's a 41% increase in performance which is more than the clock speed difference would suggest. So this is a game that benefits greatly from having more than 32 MB of memory. That's obviously too little for these settings in this game. And then we see the Radeon SDR which its performance was basically broken. I'm not sure if it was a driver issue or if the engine is for some reason unable to cope with SDR memory on a graphics card, but it was a complete slideshow. As you can see, it only averaged around one frame per second, which it was pretty agonizing. 
and the Radeon 7500 only turns in a 30% improvement in performance over the Radeon, which is the lowest we'll see in these benchmarks. And lastly, we have Half-Life 2. Now, just like Unreal Tournament 2004, these cards were not designed for games this new, but this game is highly optimized for older cards, and its DirectX 7 path is extremely fast and efficient. Unfortunately, you just can't use it anymore with the current version on Steam. However, if you can find an older version of the game prior to the engine updates, you can see that even the Radeon SDR card manages to turn in very playable performance at 1280 by 1024 with all high settings. The increase going to the DDR 32 MB version is only 15%, but then going to the 64 MB DDR card yields a 27% increase in performance. So this game obviously benefits from having a decent amount of video memory, but that memory also needs to be of an adequate speed. And then we see the biggest jump in all the testing from the Radeon DDR 64 MB to the Radeon 7500 with a 70% improvement. A very impressive jump in performance at almost 122 frames per second and a very playable experience with any card you choose. In just nine months, ATI had essentially reinvented itself, creating a new brand from scratch and a new architecture which more than doubled the performance of its previous single GPU flagship. With one new product, they became instant contenders in the high-end graphics market, forcing both consumers and competitors alike to take notice. The Radeon started what has endured today as one of the most recognizable names in the world of GPUs, bringing with it Z compression technology that allowed a two pipeline GPU to compete against cards with twice as many, laying the groundwork for efficient geometry rendering that is fundamental today. It didn't necessarily receive the respect that it deserved back in the day, but there's hope in modern times that history can recognize the Radeon for its innovative contributions to the industry. If you enjoyed this look back, please click the like button. Thanks for watching. I'm Nathan, and this has been Pixel Pipes.